vanishes from a Las Vegas suburb, his loved ones are baffled. There was never any inkling that he would just up and leave his own family. No matter where he was, he would have picked up the phone. I started to get a big gut feeling. A missing persons investigation brings to light accusations of twisted sexual escapades. So he'd like to have a three-way type start. And things if he did this, you really love me. In a place like Sin City, how far will people go to protect their darkest secrets? He was going to be a whistleblower, and that had something to do with his disappearance. He looked down and noticed what he believed to be a human hand sticking out. He's a sick individual. Why didn't you just kill him then? I didn't kill him. That would have been a good opportunity. I think it's everybody's impression that she's the puppet master pulling the strings. She knew she was in the quicksand and she was ready to sell anyone down the road. On April 21st, 2006, Police in the Las Vegas suburb of Henderson, Nevada, received word of a potential missing person, 47-year-old Larry Thomas. A man by the name of William Peters, who uh, actually lives in New York, called and referenced that he hadn't heard from his mom in some period of time. William Peters informed the desk officer that he's very close with Larry Thomas and that he would speak to him multiple times a week, either via text or via phone call. All of the times that I called Larry, whether it was his work number, his private number at work, or his cell phone, all of my messages went to his voicemail. And it was just not of Larry's makeup not to answer the phone. No matter where he was or whether he was in trouble or not in trouble, he would have picked up the phone. When I contacted my sister Stephanie, she told me that Larry packed a bag and he left. So I started to get a bad gut feeling. William gives police contact information of both Larry and Stephanie Thomas. The desk office wants it went straight to voicemail. The Henderson police weren't able to contact Larry. They contact his wife, Stephanie. Police requested she come in for a further interview. The officers want to gather as many facts as possible. Born in New York on March 26, 1959, Larry Thomas's main passion in life revealed itself at an early age. Even as a child, Larry showed an interest in cars. He was always tinkering around with vehicles. If anything mechanically <laughs> had a problem, he would jump in and work on it. One of four boys, Larry had the privilege of being raised in a tight-knit, supportive family. He had a pretty decent uh, childhood. You know, he, he had some great family fun. At just 21 years old, he his own gas station and auto repair shop on Long Island. He's a well-respected man in, in his field with the automotive world. One afternoon, when Larry was 22, a beautiful young woman in a waitress uniform pulled up to get some gas. It was 19-year-old Stephanie Peters. Stephanie was my older sister. We were very close. I mean, you know, growing up, I used to say that Stephanie was my angel you know she was always there for me she worked in some tough locations bars restaurants she would be the first one to get involved break up the fights and throw people out she didn't take anyone shit. if you crossed her or the family then then you had to you had to pay for it that was just the way she was but like larry stephanie had a soft side too she was a caring person you know and i guess when you have two people that have similar personalities you just start to talk soon larry and stephanie were talking nearly every day 
she made it more of a habit to go into the gas station and, you know, talk to Larry a little more. And, you know, he always gave her the time of day. They just hit it off. After dating for four years, the couple married in 1986. In the coming years, they had five children, and Larry and Stephanie devoted themselves to their family. People have described Larry as a very good father, somebody who doted on his children and took care of them. Raising five children. I'm working, and for Larry, that wasn't good enough. He wanted to be the breadwinner, so there was always a parent home to raise the kids. In the early 2000s, the couple relocated to the Las Vegas suburb of Henderson, where the cost of living was lower and Stephanie could stay home. They both loved it. They were outside more often with the kids. You know, that pool, you know, it was more family fun and that's what he wanted for his family. Larry took a job that allowed him even more flexibility teaching auto repair at the College of Southern Nevada. But Stephanie struggled to transition into the role of stay-at-home mom. She went looking for a job. She truly felt she needed to be out, you know, working. It wound up that if she was able to work a couple hours here or there, you know, even at night, that would be fine because he'd be home to take care of the kids at that point. Stephanie's no-nonsense personality was a perfect match for Las Vegas bar scene, and her attitude as a waitress soon caught the attention of a bouncer named Sean Pritchett. Sean, as she got to know him, winds up that he explains to her that, you know, he's got this uh, home improvement business that he's got, and that he needed someone, you know, uh, to do his books. Soon, Stephanie's management skills transformed Sean's small operation into a competitive company. She was over good financially you know she understood a lot sean asked stephanie to uh become partners with him in this house painting business sean and stephanie's painting business seemed to be on the rise larry was doing well enough at school where he actually had a series of promotions and was doing pretty well by himself things were going pretty good for all of the parties when Stephanie explained that Larry packed a bag and left the kids, you know, I knew that there was something wrong. After Larry Thomas was reported missing, Stephanie reveals to police on April 22nd, 2006, that it has been nine days since she last saw him. According to Stephanie, that morning they had had a pretty big argument and that he left. Larry ended up going to work, and later that afternoon, she took the five kids to her mother's house on the other side of town to color Easter eggs. Later on that night, while they were there, she told us that she received numerous phone calls from Larry. Stephanie says she gathered up the kids and swung by Walmart around 12 a.m. before returning home with an armload of groceries. She noticed that his car wasn't there. She checked the downstairs bedroom and noticed that a lot of his clothing was gone, his laptop was gone, and she also noticed that his toiletries as well as his jewelry was gone. Her initial assessment is, Larry's mad at me, he's going to disappear for a few days, then I'll hear from him in a couple of days. Stephanie says that as the days passed, she's become increasingly worried that Larry isn't coming back, and she has a theory as to why. Stephanie made the allegation that her husband might have been having an affair and that very possibly he had run off with this other woman. At this point, in order to begin an investigation, the officers want to determine if there is foul play involved. Coming up, one affair allegation leads detectives to another. He believed that his wife was having an affair business partner and a look behind closed doors reveals twisted fantasies he liked violent and wanted me to do things that i don't normally do April 22nd, 
2nd, 2006. Police in Henderson, Nevada are investigating the disappearance of 47-year-old father of five, Larry Thomas. Larry's wife, Stephanie, tells police she has reason to suspect Larry left her for another woman. She said that she didn't know who the woman was, but she did know that there was a phone number that Larry called very frequently and appeared to be secretive during those conversations. She gave that phone number to the Henderson police. The Henderson police determined that it belonged to a woman named Marianne Milky. Before reaching out to Larry's alleged mistress, investigators follow their usual missing person protocol, tracking Larry's activities since he was last seen on April 13th. The last phone call made was to Stephanie on the night that he disappeared, and the bank records showed no activity after the night that he disappeared. Also, part of the standard procedure when investigating a missing adult is to enter all of those things were checked to make sure that Larry didn't slip through the cracks. He is truly disappeared at this point. On April 27, 2006, detectives call Marianne Milky, the woman Stephanie believes to be her husband's mistress. She hadn't heard from him since basically the 13th of April. She was very concerned about his safety because based upon what he had described to her, he would never leave his children and, and just disappear like this. Marianne says she's known Larry for nearly two years. In her statement to police, Marianne said that yes, they had a relationship, but that relationship was only as friends. Marianne claims she and Larry vented to each other about their struggles at home. They've had these conversations and it made them both kind of feel better about their lives by talking with somebody. He confided in her about troubles he was having with Stephanie. Larry believed that his wife was having an affair with her business partner, Sean Pritchett. Marianne says Larry didn't give her very many details, but detectives suspect Larry might have confided in someone else, his brother-in-law, William Peters. During a follow-up interview with William by the missing person detectives, William also provided more information about what he believed was occurring in the residence. The affair between Stephanie and Sean were going on probably about two years. Sean lost his apartment and... Stephanie had suggested that they offer to let him stay in the extra bedroom that they had downstairs. And Larry had originally agreed to it and said, you know, I, I could do it for a couple of months. William says the problems began almost immediately. He noticed that Sean and Stephanie seemed very close for just being, I guess, a roommate situation. And that he also noticed that it seemed like Stephanie a little more provocative than she had before now that Sean was living in the house. I was telling Larry, I can see that there's something going on. You definitely need to do something. You need to tell this guy he needs to get out of your house. William tells police that finally, in December 2005, Larry put his foot down. Stephanie was absolutely livid that Larry actually asked him to move out of the house uh, she was beside herself and because the way she reacted was not normal despite the affair William tells police Larry refused to give up on Stephanie and his five kids he was a uh, family man always a family man divorce just wasn't in in the stream of anything one of the words he gave me and my wife no matter what, I don't want my kids to be without their father. There was never any inkling that he would just up and leave his own family. He wasn't somebody who was about to just drop everything in his world. It was suspicious that nobody's heard from Larry. On May 3rd, 2006, 
Detectives ask Stephanie Thomas and Sean Pritchett to come to the station for separate interviews. Tell me about Sean. All right, who is he to you? He's my business partner. Okay. Um, is that all he is to you? He is my friend. I know him for um, five years, five or six years. Or okay, so his friend only. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had sex with Sean? No. Okay. When I talk to Sean, is he going to tell me that you guys have never slept together? I uh, don't know what he's going to tell you. No, I would. Does he have any reason to tell me that he has? I can tell you this. There's a lot of my life with Larry that I don't tell people outside of my house. Okay. The uh, sex life that I had with Larry was very odd. You know, we, he was violent and wanted me to do things that I would not normally do. Okay. Larry was not always the way that he is now. Stephanie explains the problems in her marriage can be traced to one fateful night in January 2004. Larry is involved in an accident where two girls died on the parkway. Um, he was supposedly cut off a truck. The truck hit these two girls. And um, he went to jail. The actual charge was unsafe lane change. Larry is the one who asked Sean to move in. And he talked to Sean about helping run the house because we didn't have money that somebody was actually there to take care of the kids and stuff because he didn't know actually how long he was going to be in jail. When did he go to jail? He went to jail September of last, last year. And how long was he there? It was supposed to be a month. He got out earlier than he thought he was going to get out. Stephanie says the man who came home wasn't the husband that she knew. He just, he would blow up. He's gotten more since he came home from jail. That he would take the violence out on her. I never thought he'd hit me either. Okay. I never thought in my dreams. That... But he did. But he did. Stephanie says Larry's temper wasn't the only thing that changed. She tells this sort of story about Larry having sexual fantasies of watching her having sex with other men. He wanted people to move into the home so that he could have sex in the house. She said after Sean had moved into the house that Larry actually had asked Stephanie to have sex with Sean. Coming up, another side to this family man is revealed. Larry started some stuff that I really don't want to talk about because um, it's sick. And a gruesome discovery puts the missing persons case on the course we noted a human body that was in obvious stages of advanced decomposition After the disappearance of Larry Thomas, his wife Stephanie tells Henderson police that she and her business partner, Sean Pritchett, were not tangled up in a love affair, but a coerced performance of Larry's sexual desires. He got very excited at the fact that he could have sex with me and somebody else, okay? And that was with Sean. Would I call that romantic? No. Do I like the fact that I did it? Okay, so he wanted to have three-way type stuff. Right. And his thing was, if he did this, she really loved me. She said that they had been fighting a lot for the last several years, and that it was just a relief to her that he was no longer around. She sort of describes Larry as a monster, uh, you know, someone who was incapable of controlling his rage. In another interrogation room, Sean's story echoed Stephanie's. He also told us that Larry had been abusive towards Stephanie and that he had seen it while he had been living in the house. I let her in here five years ago. Great guy. I mean, I got along with him good, but it seemed like after that accident, he, I don't know, for the lack of a better word, snapped. Snapped. Um, because... 
it's sick. Okay? And I just told him, I said, this just isn't right. You know, this whole threesome thing is not right. You have a wife, you have uh, five kids. I go, you know, she doesn't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. He's a sick individual. Why didn't you just kill him then? I didn't kill him. That would have been a good opportunity. Why would I? He has five kids. Sean offers up an alibi to back his claims of innocence. Sean mentions it during his interview, is he says, you know, I was at the bar all night, and that while he was there, he had received a call from Stephanie saying that her and Larry had got an argument, and she told him that Larry up and left. In addition to his alibi, Sean provides detectives with a lead to explore the community college where Larry taught auto repair. He told me things were bad at work. I said, what do you mean bad? Larry's made all the teachers mad. He's made all the bosses mad. They had an audit out there. Uh, a bunch of people got in trouble for working on cars, charging money to work on cars. Everybody was kind of implicated. Sean went on to tell the police that Larry was going to be a whistleblower and that it was this information that might have put his life in danger and had something to do with his disappearance. Detectives release Sean and Stephanie, and on May 4th, they head over to the College of Southern Nevada to investigate Sean's theory. They did interviews with many of Larry's co-workers, his business associates at the college, his friends, and determined that this was not a viable theory. There was no evidence that anybody at the community college thought that Larry had information that would cause him harm. Everybody thought that whatever Larry's issue was, it had to be a domestic issue. One employee actually brings up the fact that Larry had told her that he felt that Sean was trying to have him killed. Larry had a life insurance policy where Stephanie would have received $250,000 at the time of Larry's death. She believes that Sean may have been plotting to kill him, sort of take over his life, get the life insurance. Although the insurance provides a possible motive, there is no direct... I think that fairly early on, the police were of the opinion that something wasn't completely right about this situation. But there was no body that was found. There's nothing that sticks out as clearly indicative of criminal activity. The investigators were looking at all the leads in this missing persons case. They were looking at co-workers. They were interviewing family and friends and trying to determine what happened to Larry. And I was praying to every saint that could that they were going to find him alive. You know, maybe beaten up or whatever. They were going to find him alive. Over a month after Larry was last seen, Henderson detectives receive a surprising development in the case out of San Bernardino, California. Our sheriff's dispatch center received a call on an administrative line, not a 911 call, of a suspicious circumstances uh, out in a remote part of the Mojave Desert. A gentleman and his family were out in that area just taking photographs of what was left of the old ranch. And after he took the photographs, uh, he looked down and noticed what he believed to be a human hand sticking out. We were dispatched out there on May 14th of 2006. We noted a human body that was in obvious stages of advanced decomposition. We immediately noticed a major trauma to the head and facial area of the body. It also appeared at that point in time that it was the body of a male subject. There was no physical evidence located at the scene and based on their investigation, it appeared more that the body had been dumped there. San Bernardino deputies send the body for autopsy. 
the victim had multiple blunt force trauma injuries to his head as well as his body. The coroner believed that it was possible that he had crushing injuries consistent with being run over by a car. They also noticed on the clothing that the person was wearing, it had the name Larry Thomas on the inside of the clothing. They see in the NCIC that Larry Thomas has been reported missing out of Henderson back in April of 2006. We were able to compare the fingerprints from our male to the fingerprints on the missing person and realize that it was indeed the same person. San Bernardino deputies notify the Henderson. We told Stephanie that we had located the body of her husband. There was really no emotional response at all. That definitely sets off a red flag. Investigators break the news to Larry's friends and family. They learn that Sean has made himself a permanent fixture in the Thomas house. He pretty much stepped in as a fatherly role right from the minute Larry went missing. All the pictures of Larry are no longer around. There are pictures of Sean, like the family man, in the house now. And he's set up house with Stephanie and the children as if he's the father. Not only that. Friends and family say that Sean has been slowly turning Larry's children against him. They were told daddy ran off with another woman. You know, uh, he, he left us for another woman. He was no good. He wasn't a good dad. He has been telling these children things that he wouldn't tell any child, let alone um, these children whose father has been found murdered. Based upon everything that was looked at at this point, the only thing that sense is Sean likely had something to do with it. Coming up, investigators work to piece together a case against their suspects. There has to be some type of physical evidence in order to bring this case forward and make arrests. I either have you as an accomplice or I have you as an witness. You guys think I'm part of it. Can I tell you the truth? I don't believe me anyway. are zeroing in on Sean Pritchett and Stephanie Thomas as the main suspects in the murder of Larry Thomas. A subpoena of Sean's phone and GPS location records from April 13th, 2006, the night of Larry's disappearance, shed some light on a potential murder path. We can tell that Sean is at the house at the time that we believe Larry would have arrived home. Once Larry would have arrived home, he's there for a short period of time. He then leaves. He travels. It shows him then get on I-15, heading south towards California, where he pings on a cell tower near the state line. And then actually at around 3 o'clock in the morning, he hits on a cell tower that is within a couple miles of the area where Larry's body was found. The alibi is completely false but they pretty much conclusively established he's the killer of Larry Thomas. With Sean now their prime suspect, investigators must determine if he acted alone. When detectives check Stephanie's GPS location, the records confirm that she was at her mom's house, but they also provide evidence suggesting potential involvement in the plot. We noticed that Larry's last call that he makes is shortly after 10 o'clock that night, and he calls Stephanie. Almost immediately after she receives that phone call from Larry, her phone records show that she immediately calls Sean. It makes us think that, you know, she's got to know what's going on. Around 11 o'clock that night, Sean calls Stephanie. The minute he makes his first phone call, to Stephanie after leaving the house, Stephanie now starts driving back to the house. So it's almost as though he's saying, hey, you can come home now. The two main 
suspects are definitely Sean and Stephanie. However, there has to be some type of physical evidence in order to bring this case forward and make arrests. They didn't have it. For the next 18 months, detectives scrambled to find the smoking gun. We don't have any evidence left at the scene. Uh, we don't have any evidence at the house that shows that that's where Larry was killed. At this point in the investigation, it hit somewhat of a dead end. Though Sean remains distant, Stephanie keeps an open dialogue with investigators. Here's the thing, you know, like I told you before, Sean is a major suspect in this case. I know, you've told me a hundred okay. times, and you keep saying you got such hard evidence against him, why don't you come and freaking get him? He's gonna be, okay? But the thing is, is I know, based on all the stuff that I've investigated, that you know something about it. You guys think I'm a part of it. I'm losing everything that I have. And I tell you the truth, and you don't believe me anyway. Finally, nearly 18 months after Larry's body was found, law enforcement receives a break in the case on Halloween 2007, when a tip comes in from a local corrections officer. They told me that they had been at a quick care in Las Vegas a couple weeks prior, and while they were there, they spoke to a lady by the name of Jennifer McHugh. Jennifer McHugh, who was the sister of Stephanie, had information that was related to this case. They're at a nearby coffee shop on October 31st, 2007. There, Jennifer admits that she's been keeping a disturbing secret for nearly two years. She said Sean had actually confessed to every aspect of the crime to her husband during a conversation. Jennifer says that her husband Albert McHugh told her everything a few days later. Stephanie had spoke to Larry while he was leaving the campus, and he was telling her, you know, get ready to leave, I'll be home in a little bit. She told Sean that Larry had left work and he should be home in a couple of minutes. It was done in the house. Sean waited for him to come home. Took Larry's truck and drove him out to California. She that Larry had been killed, he drove the truck over Larry while he was in the desert. Sean later dismantled the truck and then ended up selling the parts to different people. Stephanie created this alibi by going to her mother's house to make sure nobody could accuse her of being the person that harmed her husband. She didn't leave my mom's house until 11.30, which is very unusual for her to stay that long. Sean told her to make sure wherever she was that night that she was at a specific place at a certain time so that they would see her. Though Jennifer's statement is compelling, detectives meet with her husband Albert the following day in an attempt to corroborate her claims. He basically says, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no information uh, about the murder of Larry. I have, Sean has never talked to me about we pretty much were under the impression that Albert's not telling us the truth. He's not being honest. The following day, November 1st, 2007, detectives obtain a search warrant for the McHugh residence. In the garage, detectives find a steering column discarded under a workbench. Detectives examine the steering column and go through the model numbers and date numbers that are on the steering column. Um, it came back where it would have matched a 2005 Chevy truck, which is what Larry had been driving. We actually confront Albert and say, look, we know you're not being truthful, but even with giving him that, he still didn't give us any information. So at that point, we actually arrested Albert for possession of stolen property. Secure arrest warrants for their suspects. I look back in to see if maybe Sean or Stephanie or anyone involved that we believe may have pawned items that belong to Larry. We did an online search through the database that collects all pawns that occur throughout the country. I found that on April 16th 
on Easter Sunday, three days after Larry went missing, Sean pawned three rings. Detectives go to the pawn shop and collect the three rings that Sean had sold. Our first thought was, there's a possibility that this jewelry could be Larry's. I then contacted some of Larry's family and asked if they knew of any jewelry that Larry wore. I said, actually, you know, we went through a few pictures and I says, I have one of him dancing with my mother-in-law at my wedding. I said, I can see he's wearing a ring there. And they said, I just, you know, send it to me. Detectives compare the pawned ring to the photograph of Larry. Larry is actually wearing a ring that appears to be the exact same ring that was recovered from the pawn shop. That was a pretty compelling piece of evidence to indicate that Sean's the killer. After obtaining an arrest warrant the following day, detectives conduct a traffic stop and place Sean under arrest for murder. Sean, just as he did two years earlier, refused to give any type of statement regarding what had occurred. Stephanie was there, but at that point, we still hadn't felt that we had enough to charge her, um, so she wasn't arrested. Now that Larry's presumed killer is behind bars, detectives need to uncover the evidence that will put away a suspected mastermind. She obviously knew at that point she was so deep, she absolutely went over the deep end. Coming up, detectives cultivate grounds for a lover's betrayal. Please reach out to Stephanie and say, look, kind of the, the gig is up. I could tell by the look on her face when she saw me walk in, she knew what was happening. after the murder of Larry Thomas, investigators have Sean Pritchett in custody. Nanny Thomas. Essentially, the day that Sean's arrested, the police reach out to Stephanie and say, look, the gig is up. You need to come down here and talk to us. And so she is, oh my God, I can't believe that Sean did this. She changed her story from earlier interviews with her. She actually said, you know, Larry was never abusive. So she tried to just turn around and say, well, uh, you know, I was just making that up because that's what Sean was telling me to say. At this point, she knew she was into quicksand and she was ready to sell anyone down the river. The next day, February 13th, detectives once again approach Sean's friend, Albert McHugh. And Albert finally says, you're right. I did tell my wife all of that. It's all true. Albert turns into a gold mine of information. He not only corroborates the statements that his wife told police about Sean confessing to him, he also related to investigators that it was Larry's wife, Stephanie, that was the driving force behind the murder. I think it's everybody's impression in this case that Stephanie is the one that's sort of the puppet master pulling the strings. She's the one who would have received a $240,000 life insurance. The information from Albert is enough to secure an arrest warrant for Stephanie. On March 31st, 2008, detectives find her at the Las Vegas casino where she works. I could tell by the look on her face when she saw me walk in, she knew what was happening. Steph, you got a minute? I can talk to I need to talk here real quick. Yep. Okay. Turn around. Chance on your back. Stephanie, right now you are under arrest for conspiracy to clear murder, murder, and accessory murder. After two years, Stephanie is finally behind bars. But while awaiting trial, 
Stephanie meets with Detective Mike Kondratovich and tells him the toll prison has already taken on her. Yeah, yeah, no, no. That's what she can. I'm in a little room, really, really teeny, all by myself. I just sure. wanted to go home. I never want this over. I want to go home. I want to be with my kids, be with my mother. Almost two years later, after consulting her attorney, Stephanie is ready to make it. Stephanie and her attorney worked out a deal with the district attorney where she pled guilty to second degree murder for the murder of Larry Thomas. She was sentenced to 10 to 25 years. Unlike Stephanie, Sean Pritchett decides to take his chances with a jury in September of 2010. It came out that Sean had waited at the house for Larry to come home and ambushed him. When Larry came in, the house, and he had to walk in several feet before he got to a light switch, got to the light switch, the coward just uh, beat him with a uh, tire iron is what I found out afterwards. At the conclusion of the trial, the jury took about four hours to deliberate the case, um, and they came back with guilty verdicts on the charges of first-degree murder, robbery, and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to 45 years to life. He ultimately will spend the rest of his life in prison. For the Thomas family, what started as a hopeful move from New York to Las Vegas ended in tragedy. One person from work, I recall her saying he had two loves in his life, his job and his kids. And from what I've learned in talking to people, he would have done anything for his children. He is missing out on being the father and the parent that he so desperately, desperately wanted to be. And his five children will never, ever, ever have their father with them. 